Hello. My name is David Macy. I'm a professor of English here at UCO, and I am currently the interim temporary dean of the College of Liberal Arts. We are exceptionally fortunate today to have as our symposium keynote speaker, Gary K. Wolf, who is a professor emeritus of humanities at Roosevelt University, and who serves as a reviewer for Locus Magazine and the Chicago Tribune. His reviews have been collected in soundings, recipient of the BSFA award in 2006 and a Hugo nominee, in bearings, a 2011 Hugo nominee, and sightings published in 2011. His evaporating genres, essays on fantastic literature published by Wesleyan University Press received the Locus Award in 2012. Dr. Wolf is the author of The Known and the Unknown, The Iconography of Science Fiction, which received the 1981 Eaton Award, of Harlan Ellison, The Edge of Forever, co-written with Ellen Weil and published in 2002, and of David Lindsay, published in 1982. He has edited American Science Fiction, Nine Classic Novels of the 1950s, published in 2012, and American Science Fiction, Eight Classic Novels of the 1960s, published by the Library of America in 2019. Dr. Wolf received the Pilgrim Award from the Science Fiction Research Association, the Distinguished Scholarship Award from the International Association for the Fantastic in the Arts, and a World Fantasy Award for Criticism. His 24 lecture series, How Great Science Fiction Works, appeared from the Great Courses in 2016. He has received 10 Hugo nominations, two for his review collections, and eight for the Code Street podcast which he has co-hosted with Jonathan Strahan for more than 550 episodes, and which in 2021 won both the Best Fan Cast Hugo Award and the Dittmar Award, Australia's National Science Fiction Award for the Best Fan Publication. Dr. Wolf edits the Modern Masters of Science Fiction series of monographs for the University of Illinois Press, he serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts and Science Fiction Studies, and he administers the IAFA's annual Crawford Award. He lives in Chicago. Um, Dr. Wolf's presentation today, as you can see, is titled Asking the Next Question, or the Future as Mosaic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wolf to our campus and to the symposium. Well, thank you very much. I want to warn you that this is going to be in two parts and it's going to be all over the map, literally as well as figuratively. Um, the first part is what I'm calling the future of things. And I'm going to start with a book. Well, on our podcast, we sometimes recommend forthcoming books and get very enthusiastic about them. And a few years ago, we decided, let's start doing a list of books you don't need to read. So the first thing we're talking about today is a book you don't need to read. It's not even very good. Um, but it's interesting because it makes a point that I want to make about the future and about science fiction. A lot of people talk about science fiction predicting the future, and actually, it's pretty lousy at that. But the way it works sometimes makes it look as though it's predicting the future. And what I'm going to try to demonstrate is why these ideas are simply made up of bits of the present. Now, if you look at the uh, cover of this, it's a novel titled Futility, which shows a sinking ship. And that big white thing in the background is supposed to be an iceberg. This should be uh, beginning to look a little bit familiar to you. It's about a giant ship setting sail in April and hitting an iceberg and sinking. The, um, this is what it should remind you of, obviously. Now, the difference between Robertson's novel and the Titanic is that the Titanic, Titanic sank in 1912. His novel was published in 1898. He described his ship as the largest craft afloat, the greatest of the works of men. Uh, the accommodations are the same as a first-class hotel. And also, he said, with 19 watertight compartments, the ship was considered unsinkable. So that gets a little bit spooky right there. And if we go into more details, 
his 1898 novel. The name, okay, the name is creepy. There's, there's no, he thought up Titan, but look at the, the length of the ship is the same. Capacity is the same. He imagined the ship not having enough lifeboats. Um, the word unsinkable was used for both of them. And they, everything else seems to be, so obviously what happened was that people thought he must have been psychic. He must have seen the future in some way. And in fact, when he later uh, reissued the novel in 1912, they took advantage of his night, name, the Titan, and, and, uh, and made, it, made it look as though he'd been predicting the future. And he was reached, he was, he was contacted by psychics, by mystics, crediting him with seeing the future. And he kept saying, no, what I do is I look around and pay attention to what, uh, what I know. He was a, a, a sailor and a journalist. Basically, he was saying, if you look around ships being built that are uh, holding two and 3,000 passengers, this was a very competitive industry. He was simply arguing that if you look at the shipping industry, ships are getting bigger and bigger. Um, he set sail in April and hit an iceberg. That's when the sailing uh, season began. That's when the cruise season began. Icebergs were still a hazard. Um, in other words, he simply looked around him at the um, ships that were being built then and said, look, this is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and something bad is going to happen. In other words, he was simply, as his title suggests, warning us about the futility of being too proud in our technology. He was not, uh, he, he was as amazed as anybody when this actually happened because the whole point of his novel was in effect to keep it from happening. What he was doing was asking questions. And one of the things that uh, I noticed when I was first asked to do this, so I went to the website for this symposium, and it says there, we teach our students to ask the right questions. And research usually generates even more questions. I'm actually quoting from your own website. That leads me to this guy, one of the best science fiction writers of the 20th century, Theodore Sturgeon, um, made asking the next question such a cornerstone of his philosophy that he actually had a pen made of it. And this is his symbol, which he carried around with him. His point was this, every advance this species has ever made, he said, is the result of someone somewhere looking at his world, his neighborhood, his neighbor, his cave, or himself, and asking the next question. Morgan Robinson, Robertson never would have considered himself a science fiction writer at all but he knew that they were building these bigger ships. In fact, here's a ship that was being built in 1898, the year he wrote the novel. All you have to do is add you know, one more um, smokestack to it and, and you've pretty much got the Titanic. So everything that happened in his novel was simply things that he knew could happen by looking around. That's what science fiction writers call extrapolation. You take events of the present, push them a little bit into the future, and uh, you get some surprising results. Here's another, let's, let's jump up 50 years now and look at another uh, example of somebody who did think of himself as a science fiction writer. This is astounding science fiction, which was the pulp magazine that many people felt made the science fiction field grow up from just space operas and bug-eyed monsters. The story, um, Logic Named Joe, describes, it's narrated by a kind of, basically a kind of cable installer, a guy who's just a working guy for something called the Logics Corporation. And let me read you the description of what he calls a logic. He says, you got a logic in your house. It looks like a vision receiver used to, only it's got keys instead of dials, and you punch the keys for what you want to get. It's hooked up to the tank, which has the Carson circuit all fixed up with relays. And say you punch station SNAFU on your logic. Relays in the tank take over and whatever vision program SNAFU is telecasting comes up on your logic screen. Or you punch in Sally Hancock's phone number and the screen blinks and sputters and you're hooked up with the logic in her house. And if someone answers, you've got a vision phone connection. And if you punch for the weather forecast or who won today's race at Hialeah or who was mistress of the White House during Garfield's administration or what is PDQ and R selling for today, that comes up on the screen too. The relays in the tank do it. The tank is a big building full of all the facts in creation 
and all the recorded telecasts ever made, and it's hooked in with all the other tanks all over the country, and anything you want to know or see or hear, you punch for it and you got it. Also, it does math, keeps your books, acts as an arts consultant, chemist, physician, astronomer, tea leaf reader, advice to the lovelorn. Sound familiar? This is, yeah. Uh, this is 1946. And if you just ignore his language, you kind of translate it into our language, he's basically talking about the internet. He's talking about your personal computer or your phone, um, Wikipedia, streaming video, FaceTime. Um, and he uses the language of 1946. So he's using the term relays from telephone technology. He's not talking about integrated circuits. The, keep in mind, the transistor isn't going to be invented for another year after this. He talks about a tank rather than servers. He talks about something called the Carson circuit rather than a Google algorithm. And if I were to quote further from the story, we'd find that each logic has its own code signal, which basically could be read as IP address. They can be used to plot crimes, such as how to rob a bank or how to murder somebody. Um, Personal privacy is threatened by their overuse because people can sneak into other people's logics. And society becomes so dependent on such machines that if we shut them off, he says, we go back to a kind of civilization we've forgotten how to run. That's a question that you can ask right now if you shut down the internet tomorrow. In other words, he even goes to suggest maybe the logics will begin to program themselves and talk to themselves and develop their own consciousness which is a really early version of what some science fiction writers today call the singularity, the point at which technology is so self-contained that we can't even keep up with it. And this is four or five decades before computers ever were in anybody's house. Uh, here's the interior illustration for that story. And you can kind of see, um, apart from the pulp magazine, you know, uh, sexy uh, model in the back, there's a keyboard there, there's some sort of very industrial looking things. He's trying to, um, the, the, the artist is trying to imagine what the technology would look like. Um, and supposedly the circuit connections are up there. It's not a very good illustration really, uh, but it's probably the first picture in the world of what we would now call a personal computer. But where did it come from? Well, again, Leinster was simply looking around at what he saw in 1946. And here's some of the things he saw. One, there was such a thing as a teletypewriter. It had been in use since the 1930s, which is a remote terminal connected to other uh, information sources. Television was available in 1940. So now he's thinking, okay, we put the teletypewriter together with the television. Um, instead of the, uh, the tanks, you had essentially a, a telephone switchboard like this. And these exchanges were available throughout the 1940s. And since he was also uh, something of a tech geek, he was aware of the fact that a computer was being built. In fact, the month before his story appeared, the really the first functioning computer, the ENIAC was introduced. And again, you can see uh, the size of that on uh, either of these slides. It's the first general purpose computer. Uh, it's interesting that he put all these things together and said, look, if you ha have this in one machine in your house, you've basically got, well, to quote him again, when a TV set and an integral calculator and a telephone are added together to make a household gadget that everybody uses, it's very convenient indeed. Everybody has a secretarial service and a filing system and information service plus entertainment and television, telephone systems as a matter of course. That quotation isn't from his story. That quotation is from a treatment he did for a TV version of his story in the 1950s. And what I think is kind of interesting is that the TV producers passed on the idea. They said, this is just way too far-fetched. It's never gonna happen. So they did not make a TV show out of it. The more important questions that Lion Stewart's asking were social questions rather than technological questions. Uh, the idea that um, logics would be a household 
implement was hardly a new idea. Science fiction in the 30s and 40s, everybody had household robots, for example, and that sort of thing. Everybody was supposed to have family helicopters. Everybody was supposed to have jetpacks. So the idea that cons consumer uh, products would, would be the end the result of this invention was right. He suspected that you know, kids would go on the logics to try to find out things they weren't supposed to find out. Kids would never go on the internet to find out things they aren't supposed to found, find out, would they? Um, he thought that uh, people would use them to spy on their neighbors. Um, even in the 1940s, there were things called party lines where you could actually pick up the phone and listen to other people because they were all on one line. So all of this stuff uh, was social behavior that existed in the 1940s. Um, but Leinster himself didn't follow up with the idea. I could go in with lots more examples about uh, this. And let me give you one just to demonstrate that it wasn't only science fiction writers who thought of these things. The most popular comic strip in the country in 1946 was about a detective named Tick, Dick Tracy. And here's Dick Tracy in 1946 with uh, his two-way wrist radio. And this was, again, a comic book artist or a comic strip artist simply figuring two things. Cops have walkie-talkies and everybody wears a wristwatch. Put them together and you're going to have uh, this. And this comic strip went on through the 60s. So by 1964, Dick Tracy now has a two-way wrist TV. Um, we're getting pretty close to that, aren't we? But uh, just to give you an idea of how, how much imagination is needed to get there, in 1946, nobody had an idea how to make one. And if you go as late as um, 1984, what's coming up, this is really Seiko's version of a smartwatch. You have no use of your arm whatsoever if you're wearing this thing. But and the part to the left looks kind of like a smartwatch, but they, at that point, couldn't imagine how you could operate a computer without a keyboard. This, for some reason, didn't go into mass production. Um, Okay, I'm going to go on to another science fiction writer, a guy named Isaac Asimov, one of the most famous science fiction writers ever. You may have seen the TV adaptation of his Foundation series last year. And he had an interesting way of classifying what he called the gambits of a science fiction story, or the, for that matter, the gambits of looking to the future in general. And there were, there were three. There were three ways of looking at the future, he said. One is if only, if this goes on, and what if. Now, the Leinster story we just talked about clearly was kind of an if only story. You know, If only we had a way to combine all the computers, telephones, televisions, and information networks into one product, that'd be great. And so he came up with the idea of logic. Uh, if we, um, the other way that we talk about uh, if only are stories that, about things that probably aren't possible, we'd like to think they are. You know, if we, could, if we could visit other galaxies and join the Galactic Federation, if only we could do that, but we don't know how to do that. If only we could travel in time. Uh, science fiction loves time travel. It probably can't ever happen for all kinds of reasons. Um, the second one, if this goes on, is what Morgan Robertson's futility was. He was basically saying, if you keep building bigger, and fancier ships and putting fewer lifeboats on them and assuming that you're invulnerable, something bad is going to happen. But more often, the if this goes on scenario is what you see in dystopian fiction and things like The Handmaid's Tale and increasingly in environmental fiction. Uh, the idea that uh, global warming is, if this goes on, well, you all know what's going to happen if this goes on. For the last 10 years, practically, it's been a convention in science fiction stories to refer to the Florida archipelago uh, because nobody can see an easy way to avoid that. The third category is one that is just, I think, random guesses. I, I think it really isn't based on projecting things into the future, but asking, well, what if we were invaded by aliens? There's no reason to think that we're going to be, uh, but it makes a good story. Uh, what if a giant asteroid or maybe 
Maybe what if the moon fell into the earth? I've, I've, has anybody seen this movie called Moonfall? It's good because it sounds to me like the dumbest movie I've ever heard of. Uh, but it's, it's possible. So a lot of these disasters, uh, I was watching, what was it? Uh, one, one of those uh, Roland Emmerich movies where neutrinos are heating up the interior of the earth and causing explosions and earthquakes and hurricanes and that sort of thing. It's just guesswork, um, but that's not really involved in trying to think about the future. It's just saying, what, what, if, what, if, the, what, what if a Terminator were sent back in time to kill Sarah Connor? It's probably not gonna happen, um, but again, it makes a good story. And it leads me into the second half of this whole talk, which I'm calling um, the future of people. What's missing from a lot of this technological stuff that I've been talking about is the human factor. And going back to that uh, Theodore Sturgeon, ask the next question, I always like to put that together with another question from what I think is one of the 20th century's great novels, Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow. And Pynchon was kind of, well, is kind of wacky. Nobody knows much about him. But Gravity's Rainbow is full of, sprinkled with, I should say, what he calls proverbs for paranoids. Uh, and one of them is, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers, which is worth pondering, especially when you are talking about asking the next question. So we've been talking about the future of things, smartwatches, ships, computers, and we could probably go on through all these devices and so forth and so on. Um, in fact, I'm gonna give you some more examples, but this time paying attention not only to the machines we're looking at, but to who's using them. Here, for example, is a 1930s version of a video phone. And as you can see, it's, uh, it looks like a telephone with some kind of a screen attached to it. But, but look at the people, the guy in the background serving drinks to them. Um, here's another one. Here's what I'm assuming, this is from the 1940s, and I'm assuming this is their version of the home shopping network. And here's a... Uh, 1950s idea of what, Uber Eats, DoorDash, something like that. Um, but what do these three pictures have in common from three different decades? If we look at the people in them, we're seeing, um, oh, here's another one. I, I forgot to mention this. A 1960s version of what a self-driving car would look like, uh, which is kind of attractive. But what I'm calling attention to now are the people in these pictures. And this is the four previous slides we've looked at. And what do they all look, what do they, these people all have in common? Uh, with the exception of um, those people in the upper left hand wearing what appear to be uh, earphones and I don't know, swim caps or something like that. Um, it's pretty much, a white middle-class future. Everybody pretty much looks the same. Um, they don't even seem to have uh, updated their uh, clothing, again, except for the people in the upper left. This person in 1960, these, they're, they're all wearing outfits of, of, of their period. This raises the question, not just what the future is like, but who gets to live in this future? Whose future is it? How do you get to be part of the future? And this is something that, um, carries over into science fiction movies, and it carries over not just to individual people, but geography. Like, where does the future happen? Let's look at some science fiction movies for a minute. Here's a 1951 movie called The Day the Earth Stood Still. And it's, it was remade with uh, Keanu Reeves, uh, but uh, I could use the Keanu Reeves thing because in both the Keanu Reeves version and this original version, the flying saucer lands in Washington, D.C. Uh, a few years later, cheapy movie, uh, if you might catch it late, it's called Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Guess where the flying saucer is? And if we jump ahead to uh, 1996, we get Independence Day and the White House gets it. Um, or for that matter, uh, another one you can find probably somewhere, I've never even seen it, called Alien Invasion, which apparently was an attempt to rip off Independence Day. My question is this, 
what do all these aliens have against Washington, D.C.? Um, or New York or, or London or, or whatever it is. Why does the future only happen in major cities in the United States or sometimes in London, sometimes in England? Um, but for several decades now, our ideas about the future have been governed by the future of things more than the future of people. And science fiction writers have been guilty of offering a vision that looks mostly American, mostly white, mostly middle class. Um, and what this means is that we export these ideas of the future around the world, and we kind of leave the people in other parts of the world to find ways of fitting into our vision. Um, there's a, I'm going to come up to the next one, but let me explain what this next one is first. In Ghana, there are uh, a lot of the movies that are shown in Ghana back in the 90s, uh, especially. We're shown in villages by traveling entrepreneurs who bring their sometimes villages without any electricity. And these entrepreneurs would carry a portable generator, a television screen and tapes or DVDs that set up a makeshift viewing or screening area. And uh, in advance of their showing of these movies, they would hire local artists and the local artists were then told to make posters. So these are all hand painted posters. Um, for rural Ghana. And, and sometimes, in matter of fact, most of the time, the artist hadn't even seen the movie that he or she was portraying. So this is, the, uh, this is one of the handmade posters for E.T. And as you can see, the, uh, the artist got a little bit confused with maybe alien because that's an alien face hugger up there in the upper right corner. And there are some seed pods down here. Um, and apparently Michael Jackson now, needless to say, by the time people saw the movie, they realized, okay, Michael Jackson is not in this movie, nor is there an alien. But the idea is that this figure, the figure of somebody who looked at least somewhat like a native of Ghana, might have made the audience feel more welcome or more a part of it. Um, here's one for the X-Men. Um, Again, in the actual movie, The X-Men, nobody looks like this, but you can see why this one would make it attractive. This is kind of a way of trying to work your way into uh, a very limited, very American version of the future. Uh, here's Alien versus Predator. I'm only showing you the really tasteful ones. If you look at the posters that they did for horror movies, they are incredibly violent and gory. Uh, if you Google Ghana movie posters, you'll find a bunch of well, what this means is how do people fit themselves into a future that somebody else has been imagining? Here's one of the greatest living science fiction writers. His name is Samuel R. Delaney. And as a young kid, he remembers reading a novel by Robert Heinlein called Starship Troopers, which again has been made into a movie. And if you've seen the movie, you have no idea what the novel is about, which is frequently what happens with movies. But some 200 pages into this novel, Delaney um, reads about the narrator who's preparing for a date. And the narrator looks into the mirror and the quotation from the novel, uh, quotation from Delaney rather, he makes a passing mention of the nearly chocolate brown hue of his face. And I did a strange double take. The hero of this book was not the blue eyed blonde hero of countless second world war films, he was not Caucasian at all. Indeed, and it gets dropped in the next sentence, his ancestors were Filipinos. In other words, for the first time in his life as a science fiction reader, Delaney encounters a character who at least looks a little like him. And I've heard the same stories from Asian writers, from uh, Latinx writers, from indigenous writers. There's a moment in, in reading when you suddenly realize I can be part of this. Um, here's another uh, popular writer who's enormously successful right now. Um, Nettie Okorafor, born in suburban Chicago, but her parents are Nigerian. She's, she won a World Fantasy Award for her novel, Who Fears Death, which is now being developed into a TV series by George R. R. Martin. She's writing, um, I think she's writing uh, the TV adaptation of Octavia Butler's Kindred right now. But she talks about walking into her local comic book shop in the 1980s. And she said, it felt like walking into a white boys club that did not want me there. 
And I'd glance at the covers of the comics and see not one person who looked like me. But one of the things that she did was, maybe to get back at that, she got her own comic book series. So this is one of her latest ones. She's got a bunch of stuff going on. So what's happening over the last few years, a few decades, um, is a shift. A shift from the future of machines to the future of inclusion, of, um, of, of the whole world being involved in, in envisioning a future. Here are some stories. I'm just going to mention them to you. I'll tell you what they are in a minute. But you can see how these differ from what we saw in those 1950s movies or those 1930s stories. A spaceship lands in the waters off a major city, first contact with aliens results, the city is threatened with chaos. Again, this sounds like what we were seeing in New York or Washington, DC, but the city is Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and the citizens who deal with the aliens are Nigerians. Second one, a young woman who is herself neurodivergent tries to help her people escape slavery and exploitation in a brutally segregated society. But this society is on board a spaceship that is on a generations long voyage to find a habitable planet after the earth has become uninhabitable. Um, a bright nine year old boy figures out how, remote, how to remote control self assembling swarms of camera enhanced bots, basically many drones, and he uses this to spy on his neighbors and, and create chaos. But it's not in Silicon Valley or any place, it's in uh, a, a future Istanbul. There's a novel about a seven-year-old girl named Tam Tam who looks forward to carnival every year in her Caribbean village. But this village is on a planet Toussaint, which was colonized by Caribbeans, uh, Caribbean cultures, mostly Jamaican, uh, in the far future. Um, there's a story, a really good series of stories about a busy interplanetary spaceport. It could be something out of Star Wars. And characters from all over the universe come there and they get drunk and they get in fights and that sort of thing. But again, it's not on Tatooine, it's, not, it's, it's in Tel Aviv, Israel. And finally, a science fiction novel about contact with aliens becomes an enormous bestseller all over the world. Eight million copies are sold. The author becomes a media celebrity in his home country to the extent that hundreds of homemade TikTok style videos show up on the internet uh, dramatizing scenes from his novel. The novel becomes the first non-English work to win a Hugo Award. And it's um, going to be, a, as a matter of fact, it's going to be a Netflix series this fall. That novel is called, well, let me go back to the next one. The one down here, it's called The Three-Body Problem by a Chinese writer named Sishin Lu. So you can watch out for that on Netflix. It, it, it may be good. I don't know. I think they frequently mess these things up. But th th these are the novels I was talking about. The upper left is Nedia Korofo's novel, Lagoon, Aliens Arriving in Lagos. Uh, Rivers Solomon, who is a non-binary uh, neuroatypical writer, uh, wrote An Unkindness of Ghost about the Generation Starship. The Dervish House is Future Istanbul by Ian MacDonald. Uh, the far future planet Toussaint is a uh, Jamaican Canadian American writer, Nalo Hopkinson, called Midnight Robber. And uh, the Israeli born Lavi Titter wrote uh, Central Station in Tel Aviv. In other words, the future is now all over the world. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a very encouraging development. The, um, I want to leave some time for some questions afterwards, but to give an example of how diversified things have become. Here are some recent anthologies that I've read and reviewed. And as you can see, 20 years ago, none of these books would have existed. Again, uh, well, actually 20 years ago, the one on the upper left, that's um, an anthology of African-American science fiction and fantasy put together by Cherie Thomas about 20 years ago, exactly. And going back to the early uh, 20th century, uh, second one from the uh, left on the top, Cosmos Latinos, uh, Latin American science fiction. Then the Golang's book of South Asian science fiction from Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal. The one over here called Ready Made Bodhisattva is uh, all South Korean science fiction. And if you don't think South Korea is taking over the science fiction world, look at almost anything that shows up on your Netflix queue. Uh, not only are they doing really good zombie movies, but 
uh, they've got uh, some very uh, well-made, well-thought-out science fiction stories. Synopticon is con contemporary Chinese science fiction. Uh, Africa Risen is an anthology that isn't even out yet by Ogena Chawe, uh, Don Lick Pecky, uh, of current African science fiction. The one next to it is African science fiction. And the one finally, the lower left, is, uh, is, is Israeli science fiction. So in other words, what we're starting to do is uh, think about the future in terms of people, the furniture of science fiction, the machines, the computers, the robots, the spaceships, it's, we're getting more sophisticated about what they look like, but basically that furniture is the same it's been for a hundred years. Um, what's changed is the people who are now participating in the future, who are creating the future. And what I'm thinking that, uh, I'm then thinking this is a good thing. Future doesn't contain nothing but those, I, I don't want to say white suburbanites. I don't know there were suburbanites, but they were still dressed in their 1955 clothes. Nothing had changed uh, in those earlier versions. Now we're beginning to see uh, that a future, as it's being imagined by writers today, offers perspectives from all different nations, from all ages, skin colors, shapes, gender identities, uh, as well as disabled, neurodivergent, or simply science fiction geeks. Uh, who've always been there, but, but now are, are a more welcoming community. And my argument is that these new perspectives can make old stories completely new again. That uh, novel that I mentioned, An Unkindness of Ghosts, it follows the almost the exact same plot as the 1941 Heinlein stories. People are on a spaceship, and many of them don't even know they're on a spaceship until they discover that there's another world outside it. Uh, but again, you have a non-binary neurodivergent main character who is now the hero uh, of the story. And in fact, uh, some of the neurological issues are what enable them to, uh, to solve the problem on board the spaceship. The um, idea of offering old stories from new perspectives isn't confined to science fiction. It is entirely new. I noticed on the program that I guess this morning there was a presentation on uh, Jean Reese's novel, The Wide Sargasso Sea, which is a reimagining of um, uh, Jane Eyre from a different perspective. And more and more of this is going on. People are reimagining classics of literature. There was um, a novelist named Molly Tanzer revisited uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, Oscar Wilde's uh, famous fantasy but gender flipped it. So the Dorian Gray becomes Dorina and it involves some uh, sort of scary supernatural things. Uh, last year, there's a, a novelist named Mi Vo. Uh, she's of Vietnamese descent, but she was born in the Midwest, wrote uh, a novel called The Chosen and the Beautiful, which is basically the story of the great Gatsby, but it's told from the point of view of Daisy Buchanan's, in this novel, Girlfriend, so there's clearly a gay relationship at the center of the novel, which might be in Gatsby's novel or might not be. Um, but um, now uh, Jordan Baker is of Vietnamese descent. She's an orphan, she's gay, and she has supernatural powers. It all fits in. Uh, and it makes it doesn't destroy uh, the great Gatsby. As a matter of fact, it shows a great deal of respect for it. Um, I'm not talking about stuff like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. I'm talking about people who are really in dialogue with the... Um, with the literature and the movies that are out there. Um, and again, this goes on in all over popular culture and you see it happening um, in Broadway musicals like Wicked. You see it happening in movies like Maleficent and Cruella. As a matter of fact, Disney is just going through all the villains and sort of flipping things to see from their point of view, which is probably a healthy thing to do. Um, in other words, my point is, that this fiction, this kind of fiction, creates new worlds, not by imagining them from scratch, but by reimagining them from new angles and new perspectives. And in many cases, from perspectives that uh, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago might have been invisible or suppressed. Uh, Samuel Delaney tells another story about trying to sell a story to Astounding Science Fiction, which was the leading science fiction magazine in the 1960s, and getting a note back from the editor saying, 
I don't think that our readers will be able to identify with a main character who's not white. Um, that would never happen today, or it certainly wouldn't happen about, it, it wouldn't, nobody would admit that it happened if it happened today, let me put it that way. So in other words, every time you reimagine somebody else's future and put yourself in it, you're reinventing the future for everybody. Uh, you're, you're in an age in which African artists don't have to try to paint themselves into American movie posters. And you're in an age in which a young queer writer like Samuel Delaney is no longer surprised to find himself in a novel, or find somebody who looks like himself in a novel. And some people have called this emerging age, and I, I know I'm sounding more optimistic than I probably should, but I think it is a healthy development. Some people are calling us this the age of diversity or the age of perspective. But uh, last December, a young science fiction writer uh, named A.T. Greenblatt posted on her Twitter feed something about this, about how it, this explosion of, of, of varieties of imagining the future was happening all over the world. And she said, I hope people will remember this age. And she said, I hope when they remember it, they'll call it the rainbow age. And that's as cool a term as any. So let's, uh, let's welcome ourselves to the rainbow age. And thank you very much. If anybody has a question or a comment or wants to argue or whatever, I'll be glad to. So my question is, where do you see the intersection of fantasy and science fiction contributing to this or the, the cross genre of science fantasy? Do you think fantasy has kept up with what science fiction is trying to do by diversifying or do you think it's still farther behind? It's catching up. I mean, the, the, the fantasy and science fiction are overlapping a lot. There are a lot of uh, novels that involve both supernatural. Uh, but I think one of the problems historically is that fantasy, a lot of what we see is based on Arthurian, is based on English uh, mythologies. What we're beginning to see in fantasy are a lot of writers who are basing their fantasies on indigenous mythologies. Uh, there's a writer named Elliot de Baudard who is of uh, Vietnamese descent that lives in Paris. So it's catching up, but there's still a lot of fantasy readers who want everything to look the way it did when they started reading. People who are upset because uh, Wheel of Time had characters of color that weren't of color in, in the novels. Uh, this is going to be a big issue probably when, uh, uh, well, let me see, what else? What, what are some of the new things? Uh, which one? Yeah, okay, that kind of thing. So, so basically there's a, conservative readership that wants everything to be the way it was when we were kids. And I think they resist it. But my sense is that writers are, again, being fantasy writers are becoming as diverse as, um, as science fiction writers. And I'd add to that horror writers because one, maybe the, one of the leading horror writers right now, not counting Stephen King because he's his own thing, is a guy named Stephen Graham Jones, who's Native American. Uh, and he's really good. And his horror looks different. Some of it's pretty gruesome, but it looks different. And it feels like a new kind of world. But that's a very good question. Thank you. Hi, thanks. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, one thing that you mentioned, especially in relation to this, uh, I think it was called Unkindness of Ghost, the thing that seems to be based pretty much on Children of the Sky, and other examples of, of old plots being recycled um, um, with new kinds of characters. Do you worry that that might ultimately have a bit of a stultifying effect in the same way that, that having all these white folks back in the 50s doing all the fun stuff um, eventually got a little bit old? Do you worry that it will be the same kind of conservatism about plot as we start to introduce new protagonists and heroes into stories? Um, stultifying to whom, though? The... Uh, ultimately, everybody, I suppose. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's certainly true. If you do nothing but recycle old stories, uh, you're going to end up with... Uh, uh, with, with, with kind of a, a, a vicious circle, nothing new comes out. Um, I, I've not looked at some of the radical hard science fiction that is out there, for example, that deals with the idea of what happens if, uh, you know, if, if we can simply be, uh, we can't travel at the speed of light, but if we could download ourselves into a radio wave of some sort, we could. So there's a lot of radical thinking and what is sometimes termed as post-human science fiction. So there's a lot of science fiction based on science that we didn't know even 30 or 40 years ago. And a lot of the science fiction from back then is 
pretty hard to read by today's standards. We're not going to have household robots. We're not going to have, you can see uh, pulp illustrations from the 30s of a household robot standing at the sink washing your dishes for you. We have dishwashers that already do that. And it's, so that kind of thing isn't going to happen. Uh, so, so I don't mean to suggest that there aren't brand new ideas out there, uh, but, um, but I'm saying that there's nothing wrong with reevaluating the old ideas in different ways also. <laughs> well, all of you watch for, um, let's, see, let's go back to this for a second. The three-body problem is going to be the biggest new thing on Netflix this fall. If it happens, um, footnote to that, two, pro two possible problems. It's being developed by Benny Off and Weiss, who are the two guys who did Game of Thrones. If you saw Game of Thrones or read Game of Thrones, you knew it was really terrific until they ran out of George R. R. Martin novels, at which point they ran it off the rails. The guys who ran it off the rails are running this. So that... And I've met them and they are, well, okay. Meet me afterwards. Um, <laughs> the other problem is that Xi Jin Lu, who is a, I've met him once. He's a very, he's a middle-aged Chinese science fiction writer uh, who's tried to avoid being political, um, but he's also made statements in support of the Chinese government's treatment of the Uyghurs, which is problematical. And it raises the issue, which is another issue entirely to talk about, problematical authors having written classic works. This is a very good novel. Um, and he treats things in it like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Red Guard and the, uh, the, the brainwashing. There's, there's some very realistic stuff about it. And, but anyway, that's something to keep in mind because uh, I don't think the story, and, and when he wrote the story, he had not made any public statements that are controversial. And if anybody, oh yes. There's a, um, about how problematic authors are now having more of a platform to speak on, and especially now with where the Crawdads Sing coming out, mm -hmm. and about some talk of the author being involved in a murder with like poachers, I think, in Africa. What are your thoughts on like, say, cancel culture with authors and separating real life from fiction? I think it's a really thorny question. Uh, it came up, well, here, here's, here's an example from fantasy, as a matter of fact, not from science fiction. Years ago, there was a writer named Marion Zimmer Bradley, who had written um, a novel that reimagined the Arthurian romances from the point of view of the women. It was a feminist Arthurian romance, and it was very good and very powerful. And later, it became apparent that she and her husband were actively involved in child abuse during the time she was doing this. Now, the question is, a novel that you read 20 years ago, and now you know something else about the writer, what do you do with that information? And I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I mean, she's deceased now, so it's, it's, it's not a matter of being canceled. Um, with somebody like Xi Xin Lu, um, I, again, think the novel stands on its own. A controversy which is going on right now um, in the science fiction communities is that the 2020, so what year is it? 2023, World Science Fiction Convention is in Chengdu, China, which, which has an enormous science fiction fan base. But one of the guests of honor is, is a Russian author named Sergei, Sergei Lugachenko, who has now issued statements in support of the invasion of the Ukraine. And there are a lot of Americans who might have gone, but they're not, they're not going to a convention that honors somebody who supports what is beginning to look like an attempted genocide. Other people saying, well, wait a minute, we read these novels 20 years ago, should we hold that person against today's person? And that's not an easy question to answer for me. Uh, I would not go to a conference that uh, celebrated the invasion of the Ukraine in any way. Uh, but I can see the point of view of somebody who might say, this is, a, this is a novel before that was even an issue. What do you do with an author who's perfectly reasonable and then becomes completely, I was gonna use a word I shouldn't use, uh, Oh, insane. Uh, that happens too. I guess my question is um, also involving where the crawdads sing specifically, because that's coming out. Um, I don't know if you have any knowledge of that, but um, some people are saying that the author has involved details of a murder that she's involved with in her fiction. 
oh, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm, I've read something about that. And then there, there are other issues that come up about authors appropriating other people's blog posts into their novels. Uh, to some extent, and this is gonna sound weird, but to some extent, being involved in murder or criminal behavior is not something new for authors. In other words, this has happened. And in a sense, that's not a, okay, people should not encourage murder, obviously, but in a sense, that's not the same thing as, uh, as, as bigotry and hatred and, uh, you know, and, and coming out in favor of, uh, of things like the Ukraine. In other words, that's a personal issue. And if you start getting down to personal issues about writers, then you basically don't want to ever read a biography of a writer. Uh, you, you don't really want to know. There are things you don't want to know about Hemingway. There are, certain, there are things you don't want to know about, certainly Philip Roth. Um, so to some extent, the problem we're facing now is a surfeit of information because of but all the media presence, because of Twitter and Facebook and so forth and so on. Everybody's life is out there for everybody to see. And as I said, when Mary and Zimmer Bradley, her novel was called The Mists of Avalon, nobody knew any of this stuff. And uh, does that change the novel? No, it doesn't. Does it make us sort of queasy when we read it? That's an individual decision. I think we're out of time though, aren't we? Uh, at least you. people are either that or they're fleeing in terror. Uh, okay, well, please join me in thanking again, Dr. Wolf for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.